Hello there, welcome to this podcast number five. In this podcast, it's not going to be so much about piano philosophy. Rather, I'm answering the top five questions which have been asked over the last six months or so, where I provide you know the similar a similar answer to each question. So I thought I would uh, bring these questions to my the general populace and provide you with my answers in a spoken form to give you something to think about. So the first one is generally something along the lines of that the person is studying classical, not jazz. Are my videos suitable for that kind of individual? I've also had the opposite question where people are only interested in jazz, not classical. And they say, are your beginner videos, does your philosophy apply to me even as a jazz enthusiast? Well, the answer is yes. And that is not just because I want people to stay on my channel at all. Classical and jazz, piano, in principle are the same thing. They sound different, but if you remove all the technical jargon and all the method books and all the different sound qualities available, at the end of the day, jazz and classical are both an individual sitting in front of a piano with 10 fingers playing 88 keys with or without music because in jazz you can have music if you're following a fixed melody. And the opposite is true for classical. You can be performing a fixed classical piece written on a score, but with a little bit of improvisational freedom. So yes, my videos do apply to both teams, let's say. They work for the classical pianist because, as I always say, a balanced mind is a balanced performance. So if you're playing classical music and you're only adhering to the score and you're only doing what the music tells you to do without really putting any of yourself into it, that's a shame. And my videos would help you as a classical enthusiast to spend a bit more time away from the piano. And of course, this goes for jazz pianists too, to spend a bit more time away from the piano, identifying your musical personality. I talk about this a lot because it really is so, so important. You can study everything available, but it won't affect how you naturally play. You can also allow music too easily. You can allow the music, the score, to fixate your playing in one particular way. If the music tells you to play, to play softly and it tells you to play the pedal, you will exactly do that. You'll play softly and you'll play the pedal. Now that is good to a point because that is like a composer speaking to you through the music. But there always has to be some kind of uniqueness to the piece. In one of my previous podcasts, two times because it's so true i've talked about circles there could be a thousand or a million people who draw a circle it's just a circle they you know what it looks like but you can be sure that probably almost none of those circles drawn by one million people will be exactly the same if you put them into a scanner you know and it scans one million circles drawn by one million different people you can be pretty sure that almost none of them will be exactly the same, even though they'll all look like circles. And you can apply that to the classical piano realm, that there could be 20,000 people, 100,000 people, a million people playing one Chopin or Liszt piece of music, and it'll sound different every single time. Which begs the question, which one is the best? Well, the point is that there isn't a best, because everybody's understanding of the word good or bad is different. Some people like it faster, some like it more slow, some like it when uh, it's more expressive, others like it with more or less pedal. It's always different. So it's impossible to say that's the best and that's the worst. So highlight your individuality. And that's what my videos will encourage you to do, whether you're a jazz pianist or a classical pianist. Jazz piano does require more awareness of note values and classical doesn't, which is simply a fact because the music tells you what to do in classical music. And I've met and I've, had, I've communicated with many online and I've met in real life classical pianists who have absolutely no idea how to name a chord. Maybe they know major and minor. Maybe they know the difference between a major seventh chord and a dominant seventh chord. And perhaps they know minor seventh. But when it starts to go into more jazzier things, flat 13s and sharpened 11s and suspended fourths with ninths and all that kind of stuff they have no idea now it's a very simple philosophy to teach how to name chords as you know i well, you can have a look at my videos i have a video called naming chords and emotional connections there's a link below having said that 
So my videos will, if you are a jazz pianist, they will help you to name chords and increase your note value awareness. And if you're a classical pianist, that's still very useful to know. It helps you to create an emotional connection with what you're playing. For example, if you play the interval of a flattened fifth, that always sounds like a flattened fifth in every key. So if you wanted to improvise a little bit in classical or jazz, or if you are curious about why you like a particular phrase in a particular piece of music, you can then identify what it is that you like about it. Oh, there's a flattened fifth. I like that interval. It sounds nice when I do that. So the videos that I make highlight no value awareness. They highlight the need to develop an emotional connection with what you are playing. So for the jazz pianist and the classical pianist, the videos both work in that way. At the end of the day, playing the piano comes from the mind, not the fingers. The body follows the mind. So whether you're playing a classical piece, a beautiful Beethoven sonata, or you're improvising over some famous jazz song, around midnight, for example, you are still playing from your emotional center, from your musical personality. How you play is what's happening. And that that comes from the mind. That doesn't come from the fingers. So it doesn't matter whether you're interested in classical or jazz. And if you watch my videos on jazz, if you're a classical pianist, or the ones which talk more about the piano theory, not so much jazz, if you are a jazz pianist, you will always find something valuable in everything that I discuss in every video. The second question I get asked a lot, and it's something that I will drill in to my subscribers and anybody I communicate with about piano. Why are the 12 major scales so important? It is imperative, imperative, imperative that you have absolutely visualized and internalized every one of the 12 major scales. Your ego may say, I don't want to do that. I don't need to do that. Well, you do. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say you're going hiking in uh, some wilderness and there's mountains and there's trees and forests and many different kinds of landscapes and you have a map. If you only understand in the key of the map, the one that tells you what is actually on the map in terms of symbols, if you only know one of those or two of those, then when you go hiking, you're not going to understand any of your environment as you're walking around because you're not going to know what the symbols mean on the key of the map. So you're going to be missing 80% almost of what is possible. All you need to realize is that one major scale, the major scale, is simply a template which starts in 12 different places. No one of them is more complicated or less complicated than the other. Sure, they may be less common, for example, F sharp or B or uh, C sharp. These are not so common. They exist, but they're not so common. Whereas C, F, G, E flat and B flat are more common. That doesn't mean they're less or more complicated. It simply means they're more common. So once you apply the template whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half steps from all of the 12 notes, C, C sharp, D, E sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, all the notes in a 12 note block from C to B, simply find the major scale, internalize the shape. And then when you go to a piano, you will simply see it with your eyes on the piano and all the notes which are not in that major scale will disappear. They won't be important. That gives you a great confidence and actually a great power when you're playing because it puts your hands automatically in the right place and you never really get lost. So it's like having this map with a key of 12 different things and you can go hiking and you know everything. You, you can go anywhere, you understand all the map and it makes it so much more interesting. It, you know, whereas nothing is more complicated than anything else. It's very, very important to realize. It also gives you a good fingering exercise. If you just want to, for example, list primarily used major scales during his practice time. And there's a little story available where some people went to listen to him practicing. They wanted to hear the great maestro practicing and they hid outside his window. And they were very disappointed when all they heard him playing was major scales up and down the piano. Because this is the point. A piece of music, whatever it is, is just your mind moving 10 fingers, playing 88 keys. How your fingers move, you can develop a finger strength anywhere. You don't need a piano to develop your finger strength, you see. So you don't really need to waste time playing pieces 
to practice. I'm going to talk about something else in, in a moment about practice and performance. But for this point now, you don't need to sit on your piano to develop your strength because your fingers are already strong enough. You can already carry a bag which weighs 20 kilograms or more in your fingers and you don't drop it in your left hand and your right hand. So you can't say that the piano keys weigh 20 kilograms. They may, they may weigh one or two grams perhaps. So you've already got a natural strength to actually press the piano keys. So whenever you want to develop a finger technique, you can simply use major scales. And they are very useful, as I just said, because each one is a different shape. If you think about it, the major scale of C, your hand is set back from the piano because you don't need to reach up to any black keys. And your four fingers, apart from your thumb, that's just off to the side, but your four fingers are pretty much straight next to each other. But when you get into another key, let's say uh, B major, for example, B major is a different position of your arm because you need to reach up to the two black notes, C sharp and D sharp. You must use your middle finger, which is the most common finger in the scale of B, but there is no correct or wrong fingering. There's your most comfortable fingering. You would generally play your middle finger on the D sharp, and that would be a pivot point as your thumb comes under to play the E, and then your index middle and ring finger would play the F sharp, G sharp and A sharp. That's a completely different kind of movement from the C major where your thumb just squeezes under your middle finger and hits the F. So each major scale gives you a different kind of fingering opportunity as an exercise, not in the sense of making it stronger, but in the sense of doing something on the piano, just to play with your eyes closed, just for some precision practice, things like this. If you played a uh, a nice exercise which is to use your thumb and alternating your thumb with your four fingers in whichever way is comfortable alternating just all the way up the major scale so you may start on for example b flat your thumb is on b flat and then you would alternate b flat with your thumb and the c on your index finger try to imagine this on your internal piano thumb on the b flat index on the c thumb on the b flat again perhaps again index finger on the d thumb on the b flat Maybe your middle finger on the E flat, thumb on the B flat again, middle, middle finger on the F, and then B flat, alternating with your fingers as comfortable up the major scale. C, B flat, D, B flat, E flat, B flat, F, B flat, G, B flat, A, B flat, B flat. Each major scale will provide you with a different shape for doing that in both of your hands, of course. So major scales are useful for your bearings, for your chords because all different songs go through different keys. If you like a song in the key of F, but you don't know the scale of B flat, you're, you have a problem because B flat and F in any key, going up a fourth is very common. So F up to B flat is a fourth. If you don't know the scale of B flat and you're learning a jazz song, for example, in the key of F, uh, you're gonna be lost when you come to the next chord, which will probably be a B flat, major seventh or minor seventh, and you don't know the major scale. So just learn the 12 major scales, spend one day on each one, imagine the piano keyboard in your mind, which is very easy, it's just two blacks, three blacks, two blacks, three blacks, and see the major scale in that mind, on that internal piano, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And the more you do it away from the piano, the stronger it will become. And when you get to the piano, it will be so natural for you that you won't even need to think about the major scale. You won't need to think about where to put your fingers. You won't need to think about wrong notes because you'll just know it automatically. It will just be in your mind. That's also a good reason. It, that, there is also a good reason for that, which is your conscious interference, which is overthinking, is reduced greatly when you instinctively know your major scales. So they really are so important don't bother doing anything else until your 12 major scales are absolutely, completely internalized. And you will thank me for this insistence. A third question I get asked quite regularly is that uh, people ask, how do I play what I want and what I hear when technically I cannot play it? My first response to everybody is, you can play it. Your mind can play it. Your body just hasn't caught up yet. I wrote a quite a successful, it seems, article involving a, a mountain. And it was based on the philosophy of, if you want to climb a mountain, 
Start at the top. What does that mean? At the top represents your mind being where you wish to be. The idea is that your body must climb the mountain and join the mind. Now that's only possible if the mind is patient. If it's not, you'll become frustrated, you'll give up, you'll be forcing yourself to progress faster. All very unnatural things. And this is a huge problem for people in general in all walks of life, in all different situations. But as a pianist, and especially if you follow my philosophy on water pianism, you'll know that the first rule of being a water pianist is to be like water in the sense that there isn't really a destination and that the water is just simply flowing. It doesn't consider any rock, any waterfall as an obstacle. And the pianist would do well to copy that way of living, that way of playing. As you come across a stumbling block, as you may call it, it's not. It's an opportunity for you to develop the technique that you don't have into a technique that you do have. But it's only possible if your mind remains at the top of the mountain. It doesn't mean that it's the end. It just, it's just a, an ideology that you put your mind where you want to be, for example, the top of a mountain, and your body must climb the mountain. But it's only going to keep climbing if your mind remains at the top. That's why if you want to start climbing a mountain, start at the top. So if you can't technically play what you want to play, that's okay. Because it just means that your body is on its way up the mountain. You come across a piece that you can't play or a piece that you can play, but there's a phrase in it that you can't technically do. It might be a rhythm thing. It may be your left hand is doing something much faster than your right hand. And you may think that your left hand is weaker when it isn't. So what do you do? Well, the first thing that you should do is leave the piano. Because by leaving the piano, you're allowing your internal piano to be used by the mind, which will indirectly strengthen your fingers. It may sound crazy and it may seem impossible, but you must trust me that it's true. When I was learning Liebstraum by Liszt, number three, the famous one, there's a part in there which you could call the butterfly effect. And you need to go up a particular scale, alternating your fingers, sharing left and right hand all the way up and all the way down again. When I first came to that, it was impossible for me. It didn't mean that my fingers were unable to do it, which is the same wrong way as thinking that you can't climb the mountain because your legs aren't strong enough. I mean, it's ridiculous. Just climb the mountain at your own speed. Even if you have to stop 10 times a day, eventually you'll get to the top of the mountain if your mind stays there. So I came to this piece of music and uh, I played it away from the piano. And naturally, when your mind is at peace, it's just like still water. When water is still, you can see deeper into it. And that's how your mind must be. So I spent many evenings not playing the piano. I looked at it from a distance, but uh, I put my mind exactly where I wanted to be. I can play that part. I listened to many recordings, especially Sifra. And I really got it into my body, into my mind. I could feel it. I could feel myself playing it. And the more I visualized it, the more it became easy. And I started to believe I could really play it. And uh, somehow, and it's beyond me how it's possible, but it's absolutely real and it happens to everybody, you can feel which fingers are supposed to be playing that piece. And that's not really surprising because when you're playing the piano, your hands are simply doing what your mind is telling them. Your mind doesn't need a piano on the end of your fingers. It just happens to be there because that's the thing that makes all the noise. That's the thing with the hammers and the strings in it. We could be doing the same thing on the table. There just won't be any music, but your fingers will still be moving in exactly the same way, you see? So people get really caught up with thinking that the piano is the only object and the only way that we can become better pianists by just studying on the piano. And when you're not at the piano, you're unable to study. Very, very wrong. You should actually be practicing the piano more away from the piano than at the piano for this very reason balanced mind gives you a balanced performance because it all takes place in the mind and you must must accept that so going back to the question with a quick answer how do you play what you want to play when you can't yet technically play it the basic answer you can technically play it your body just hasn't caught up yet with your mind but that doesn't mean it's not possible leave the piano imagine yourself playing it i'm reminded of one of the quotes from my water pianism book the fingers can do what the mind can imagine them doing 
and the fingers cannot do what the mind cannot imagine them doing. Think about that because it goes far beyond just playing the piano. It refers to anything that you may do which requires hand or some kind of body coordination. The fourth question is when people speak about having two hands, they say, I can't play my hands uh, together. I can't play, in, I can't think independently. My hands are always doing one thing and the other, I can't think about the other one. My right hand does this and my left hand falls to pieces. Well, there's very one, there's only one simple answer to that. You don't have two hands. It's the same strange philosophy as when I say there are no black and white notes on the piano, which is true. If the piano keys were multicolored as a rainbow, how would you be able to talk about black and white keys? You wouldn't, but they wouldn't be any different. They would still be the same things. Black and white notes are simply black and white because that's how the piano was made. It's not for any other reason at all. So you must say to yourself over and over again until you completely accept it that you don't have left hand, right hand, five fingers on the left, five fingers on the right. This is another reason that you don't number your fingers. It's completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter at all. Each finger is capable of doing what the other finger can do, which means technically that all of your fingers are number one or number two or number three. They are all equal. Think about this analogy. If there's an army and you've got 10 soldiers, you don't separate them into five groups on the same, in the same army on the same side and they never meet. So all these five soldiers know each other very well. And these five soldiers over here on the left know each other very well, but they never meet. They're both fighting in a war, in a battle, which is the analogy for playing a piece of music. So they're both playing together the same piece of music, but they never look at each other. And these five are focusing on that, and these five are focusing on that. It's very, very bad, you see? So what you need to do is leave the piano and constantly tell yourself when you're not at the piano, I don't have five and five, I have ten. You basically have one big hand because your fingers are just an extension of your mind and your mind is one thing and it's controlling each independent finger as it needs to be controlled. You're not doing that consciously. If you play a nice piece of music, the more you think about what you're doing, the more mistakes you'll make because you can't consciously control 10 fingers at the same time and the pedal and the dynamics of the piece. And if you're sight reading, concentrating on the notes. If you're improvising, concentrating on the chord changes, listening to the other musicians, following the structure of the piece. You can't possibly control consciously all of these things that happen subconsciously outside of your conscious mind. So by having 10 fingers, you automatically are training your mind, your ego, let's say, to stop interfering and saying, I have a left hand and a right hand. My left hand can't do it. My right hand can't do it. What you need to do with these soldiers is train them to work together. So this is an example of when you don't need the piano. You can, you can be sitting in traffic in your car. You can be walking home even, sitting at the desk, watching TV, doesn't matter. Not at the piano. You simply do every combination possible with your 10 fingers and you sort of wiggle them in pairs. So you put your hands out in front of you or on your lap, wherever you may be. And you might uh, begin with your left hand ring finger and your right hand index finger, for example and you wiggle, you wiggle them up and down together. And then you alternate them together, left, hand, left finger down, right finger down, left finger down, right, alternating them. And you just start, if you do this with your eyes closed, what you're doing is training your ego to get out of the way and to allow yourself to develop a stronger mental connection between these two previously never before met fingers. Then you might move on to your left hand uh, middle finger and your right hand thumb you wiggle these only with your eyes closed and just feel what they're doing because they're only being moved by your mind. And then you alternate them. The left, hand go, the left one goes down as the right one goes up. You alternate them. You need to do these kinds of exercises and you don't need a piano for that. This is just training your mind to realize that you only have 10 fingers. And then as you start to play, as the days and weeks pass, you'll just start to realize that Playing with left and right hand parts becomes easier because it's all considered one. Your fingers are an extension of your mind, which is one thing. That really is how you can overcome the problem of my left hand can't do anything when my right hand is playing. So think about that. So primarily, leave the piano for any problem that you have and work with it in your mind. You'll be amazed how your body will react to your mind's new programming. It's fascinating. 
Finally, question five, stage fright. People talk to me sometimes and they say they're very nervous about performing or they don't feel confident enough because they don't know what they're doing. Well, there are two answers to this. I'll start with the least interesting and I'll finish with the most interesting, which is my own philosophy on stage fright. First of all, if you don't feel confident around people, I would say 100% of the time, it means when it's not stage fright, when you just don't feel confident in yourself, it's because you don't honestly know what you're doing 100%. Now, you may say, I know my subject area perfectly. Well, fine. That means that you're not doubting yourself and that you have stage fright. That's fine. But I'm speaking at, the, at this point first, before I talk about stage fright, when people say, I don't feel confident playing, maybe they haven't got stage fright, but they don't feel confident playing in front of 50 people in a restaurant. That's normally, in fact, always because they don't know their pieces well enough. There is something in their subconscious mind which is saying, you don't really know what you should know. You should learn another 20 pieces. You should learn a few more nicer chords. You should learn to improvise or spend time improvising for a few more months, listening to a few more pieces before you go into the restaurant. So when people talk about having stage fright or being uncomfortable performing in front of others, there are two reasons. One, lack of self-confidence in their ability, which is normally true and justified. But if they are completely confident in what they're doing, and they are simply afraid of performing in front of people, even if they are really fantastically good, then there's a philosophy I have for this. What you must realize, and this is a fact, at least, no matter how many people are in front of you, at least 90% of them cannot do and would not do what you are doing. And that is sitting in, you know, standing on a stage, performing in front of people. So first thing to realize, that there's at least 90% of your audience. Now, if it's 100 people there, then about 90. If it's 10,000 people, then 9,000 of them. They can't do and would never do what you're doing. So you automatically have their respect. That's fantastic. Because you're in a way, you have one up on them. You have something that they don't. You can do something that they can't. You should feel proud about that. The other 10%-ish know what it feels like to do what you're doing because they are performers or they don't have stage fright. And they realize how much courage you have got together to go on stage and do what you're doing. So they know what it feels like. You're in the same boat. So that smaller 10%, you don't need to worry about them either because they also respect you because they know what it feels like. The result is 100% of your audience, you don't need to worry about. I'm going to say that again because I really want you to understand. If you're just playing with 50 people, then let's just say 40 to 45 of them would not have the confidence to play the piano in front of 50 people. So they respect you and they admire you for what you're doing or they don't care. So either way, those 45, those 40 or 45 don't matter. They respect you and they couldn't do it themselves. So good for you. And the other five or 10, they know what it feels like to get up and perform in front of people. So they respect your courage. So that's 100% of your audience, even if it's just 50 people who are on your side and there's absolutely nothing to be worried about. And the same goes for 100,000 people. 90,000 people pr would never be able to do what you're doing. And if there's maybe 10 or so thousand who could, then they know what it's like to stand in front of 10,000 people. So think about that because it, will give, it should give you a lot of confidence. And the first one I, I mentioned was that if you really don't feel confident in terms of your abilities, then it means you're simply not ready, which means itself, go and listen more, play more, learn a few more things practice a little bit more, play around. It's very, very uh, beneficial for you, I promise. Now, the final thing, this is not a question, this is like a bonus uh, few paragraphs. I've created a word, practorments. It will be in a musical dictionary one day. Practorments is a mix of two words, practice and performance. And the reason I created it is because you must see everything that you are performing as an opportunity of practice and you can dictate what that practice is you may be performing a piece in front of people or just for yourself uh, which is great could be anything Chopin mazurka something a ballad but in it you have decided that in this piece I'm practicing jumping octaves or left hand arpeggios 
So don't see the piece as a practice completely. See the piece as a 50% performance, 50% practice. On the other hand, when you really want to practice something, which is not a piece of music, you just want to play around on the piano a little bit. Whatever you do, treat it as fun. It's only the piano. It's only music. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just something to make us happy, you understand. So even if you come up with some nice little uh, reasons to practice, make games out of them. Make it into a performance. If you have a problem with, at the moment, which you're going to overcome, let's say with uh, block chords going up and down. So let's say you need to play uh, a C minor seventh and you want to learn or you want to be able to jump up and down uh, in the left hand and the right hand, C minor seven, and then jump up one octave, C minor seven, jump up one octave, C minor seven, and then do it in all the 12 keys, C sharp minor seven, D minor seven, E flat minor seven, E minor seven, etc. And you, at the moment, you cannot possibly do that. Well, of course, a lot of that time is going to be spent away from the piano, visualizing it. But when you're at the piano, make it fun, make it into a performance. Imagine that you are writing a piece of music or imagine it has been written. This piece of music is called Jumping Minor Sevenths. Make the practice a performance. It will take away the stress of it. There doesn't need to be any stress when you're playing the piano. It all has to be fun because it can't be anything else. Balanced mind makes a balanced performance. Remember that. So you want to jump up and down with minor sevenths. Jump up and down with minor sevenths. Make it into a, into a game. Do it in different time signatures. Go up quietly and slowly and then come down playing it much harder and faster. Just be creative. There are many different things that you can do. Go up with the right hand, come down with the left hand, then go up with both. Maybe alternate your hands. So you play your left and the right and then go up an octave, go left and right, up an octave, left and right, and then come down in the same way, left, right, down an octave, left, right, down an octave. Make it into some kind of performance. So practorments. A performance is an opportunity for a practice and anything that you want to practice, make it into a performance. That is enough for this podcast. And I hope I've answered a lot of your questions and given you a lot to think about. Do consider subscribing. Have a look at my blog. Maybe asking me a question in the comments below. Always appreciated. And uh, have a look at my books, perhaps. I have a philosophical approach, which you may find interesting and beneficial. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in podcast number six. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye for now.